In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, notice of this meeting has been provided by filing a copy thereof with the municipal clerk on January 7th, 2013, faxing a copy thereof to the Home News Tribune and the Star-Ledger on January 8th, 2013 at 8.47 a.m., and posting a copy thereof on the bulletin board on the main floor of Borough Hall, 221 South 5th Avenue, Highland Park, New Jersey, on January 8th, 2013 at 9 a.m. Uh, the fire exits, as I previewed, are to my left <laughs> and my right, your right and left respectively. I would ask the people on the dais, as well as any members of the public that speak, to please speak into the microphones, and assistive listening devices are available. I'm going to ask Beatrice Berman to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The format of this evening's meeting is a little different than what we typically do. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, the format's already different because we didn't call the roll. All right, so clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Minkoff? Here. Councilwoman Bro mittler Here. Councilman Erickson? Here. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Councilman Malay? Here. Councilman Potts? Here. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Here. For Attorney Schmier? Here. For Administrator Kovac? Take two. Okay, so the format for tonight's meeting is a little different than what we typically do because we have a number of special items on our agenda tonight. Uh, the first is that we have a special dedication ceremony uh, which is a, a divided into a couple of parts. The first part will include some speeches in here uh, starting with uh, Beatrice Berman, Mayor Berman's daughter, uh, we are going to be dedicating a conference room, uh, what we affectionately refer to as the fishbowl, which is the main upstairs conference room in memory of uh, Mayor Berman, who passed away last year and who served as mayor in Highland Park for eight years. So the first part of this will be uh, a speech by uh, Beachy, is her nickname, and then I've got some remarks I'd like to make. I've got a proclamation that I'm going to uh, present to you, which we can do either in here or outside, but we're going to go outside, whoever would like to come, and I'm going to ask the Berman family to assist us in uh, uncovering uh, the markers. Uh, we've got a couple of different plaques uh, uh, that uh, will commemorate and uh, memorialize permanently the conference room. So, uh, Beachy, if I could impose on you, if you would please use that podium to my right, and um, I know that you have uh, some special remarks that you've prepared for us. I hope so. Uh, there should be a switch. There's a button on the bottom. No, 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 on the bottom of the microphone. It's on now. Yeah, you just may have to get fairly close to it. Okay. Better? No. no. Can we turn up the volume on that? Hang on one second. Yeah. Brand new. Do you want to just put that down in front of your remarks? Will you be able to see? Mm. You may pick up your voice better. I'm not sure. Yeah, I probably don't need it. Okay. <laughs> that works for me. Okay. On behalf of my family, I would like to thank Mayor Minkoff and the Borough Council for this dedication to my father. He would be honored to know that his lifelong commitment the borough of Highland Park was being recognized in this permanent way. People might be asking why my dad deserves this honor, and I'm going to tell you why. Mayor Minkoff once asked me how I would describe my father, and without any hesitation, I replied, <coughs> Mr. Highland Park. Highland Park wasn't just the town in which he lived, it was the town in which he loved to live. He was its most ardent ambassador from the time he was a young man until his death. Everyone he came in contact with learned about Highland Park, New Jersey. It was as much a part of him as we were. It was in his blood. And just as he helped to shape his children's futures, he did the same for Highland Park. 
He watched and helped it grow and flourish from the tiny town of the 1920s to the borough as it stands today. Harold Berman was born in a house on Magnolia Street in 1919. The family moved to Adelaide Avenue for a few short years and then to the house on South Fourth Avenue where my dad lived for 80 years up until his death last year. It is the home in which we were raised and the home in which my mother still lives. He came from very modest means and led a modest life, but it was a life that was full of giving, not only to his family and friends and multiple organizations, but to the town that he loved so much. Someone once told my father that he was the only poor politician he knew, and my dad was very proud of that. He never used his position for wealth or personal gain. He was proud to be a member of the first graduating class of Highland Park High School in 1938. In fact, he quit school for a year while HPHS was being built so that he could say that he was a graduate of Highland Park High School. As was his nature, he joined many teams and became the school's first five-letter man in sports and wrote the words for the high school fight song. A few years after graduating, he became the first resident to enlist in World War II joining the United States Marine Corps, where he eventually became a staff sergeant serving at Iwo Jima. The Marine Corps principles of leading by example and making sound and timely decisions were ones he continued to apply at home, in business, and in the community. Marine traits such as enthusiasm, unselfishness, dependability, and integrity were traits he brought home with him. He returned home and started another chapter of his life working and marrying my mother, the former Jocelyn Miller, also of Highland Park. From the time I can remember, my father was always leaving the house for some activity or meeting. He was the ultimate volunteer, giving his time and talents to many groups and organizations. He was a founding member of the Labor Day Park Town Outing, a charter member and president of the Highland Park Exchange Club, a member of the board of the HP JCC YMHA, commander of the Jewish War Veterans Post 133 New Brunswick and a state commander, a member of the Highland Park Conservative Temple, a member of the planning board, a councilman from 1968 to 1975, and mayor for two terms, 1976 to 1980 and 1984 to 1988. These are just a few of the ways my dad contributed to his community. During his terms as mayor, it was often said that if my father wasn't home or in his garage workshop, you would probably find him in Borough Hall. It was his home away from home during the day and at night. In fact, he spent so much time here tending to all kinds of business that a disgruntled resident sent a letter to my father's boss in Ohio to tell him that my father wasn't working but was being a full-time mayor rather than a part-time mayor as the office required. His boss sure got a kick out of that. While in office, there were several things my dad was most proud to have accomplished. Among them was having this borough hall building built without a single penny of taxpayers' money, removal of a New Jersey inspection station in a residential area on Washington Avenue, initiating the sidewalk replacement program, and being instrumental in the establishment of the first commission of aging for the state. <coughs> Aside from politics, my father also left his mark throughout the borough with large formica and wood plaques which were designed and crafted by him in his workshop. Among the places they are found are this building, which is right behind Mayor Winkoff, the police and fire departments, the first aid building, and various restaurants and businesses. I hope I have given you a glimpse of my father's life, a life dedicated to service, especially to Highland Park. A plaque which hangs in his room at home has a most fitting inscription. It reads, no man can give his community a richer gift than a generous part of his precious lifetime. My family believes that that is definitely what my father did. My dad will always be remembered by his family and friends, and now, because of this dedication, he will be remembered by the town that he loved so much. Thank you. possibly add to what you just heard, but I hope that in some small way I can complement those remarks. Semper Fi, always faithful. 
the hallmark and motto of the U.S. Marines. It describes Harold Hesch Berman perfectly, a faithful husband, father, and employee, a faithful friend, colleague, Marine for sure, communal servant, and a faithful leader. I spent some time today visiting with Hesch Berman. Wait, you say, Gary, you're going crazy. Hesch passed away last year. I know. But Hesch's legacy is with all of us. And today I did something that I've not done for a long time. In 1998, this book, Reflections of Longtime Residents of Highland Park, was published. It was an intergenerational project that involved a group of students at the Irving School who interviewed long-time borough residents. I'm sorry, this is extremely emotional because what many of you may not realize is um, I went into the family business. Um, when I married into the Nelson family, Hesh became a cousin. So, and in this book is also a biography of my wife's grandmother. So, uh, this journey down memory lane uh, pr uh, it produced a lot more emotion than I had expected. So, if you'll bear with me, uh, hopefully I'll make it worth your while. Anyway, this was an inter intergenerational project that involved a group of students at the Irving School who interviewed longtime borough residents. Some of you may recall the book. Today, I reread the Honorable Harold Berman's biography, written by Eli Gable Frank and Javi Vietzi. And if you will allow me, in a manner of speaking, Hesh retold his story to me, a story I knew but never tire of hearing. I smiled while I read it. It was both moving and poignant. That biography talks about, among many other things, Hesh's service in the U.S. Marines. He recounted that he was one of 70,000 Marines who witnessed the historic flag raising on Mount Suribachi. He said he watched the flag raising while wiping away tears, which astounded me. While Hesh was kind to a fault, he had a wonderful heart. The first word that comes to my mind when I think of Hesh was tough. He was a Marine, a boxer, a football player, and yes, a mayor, a job which can also require being a little tough. So if you'll indulge me, I'd like to share a few brief reflections about Hesh Berman, and perhaps in a somewhat unconventional way. Although I served on the governing body, Hesh was not a formal mentor to me. Yet, like to many, he was a great example. I did have lots of personal contact with him over the years, and it was characterized by what he described as his special strengths creativity and resourcefulness, and a sense of humor. He also said he felt he had the ability to relate to almost anyone. And that certainly was Hesh. Look around the borough. Look behind me. You can see a tangible manifestation of his creativity. The handcrafted Locust Bonus logo, which he created. Look around us. This building was funded by a federal grant that Hesh lobbied for and the borough received. It was his creativity that meant taxpayer money would not be needed to fund this building, something of which he was especially proud. A sense of humor. For my entire time on the governing body, every time I saw Hesh, he'd give me a wry smile and say, look out, here comes a politician. <laughs> he loved to regale me with war stories, literally. Stories from his sojourns professionally, always with a twinkle in his eye. He did mention in his bio that he also was described as mischievous and that that was an apt self-description but he always ended his story with a punchline and a chuckle. Resourcefulness, Hesh did not lead an easy life, but he led a full life, a life enriched by those to whom he was close. It was enriched through his years of service to family, community, and country. He had to live by his wits, his street smarts, and the education he gave himself in so many areas. Resourceful? The politician in me would perhaps reframe that slightly. Hesh was a man who understood the importance of and had the capacity of rising to the occasion. As Hesh's health grew increasingly frail, I was ceaselessly amazed when he would appear in public, whether at a family function, at the borough's 100th anniversary celebration, he always managed to find some inner reserve of strength and summoned up youth and vitality. As we say in sports, he went into the zone. He had risen to the occasion his entire life. After all, he'd earned five letters in high school athletics. He was the first person in Highland Park to volunteer for military service for World War II. And of course, he served eight years as our mayor. My most enduring memory of Hesh, though, meant so much to many people, many of whom are not here tonight. 
Hesh's biography mentioned that the American flag had special significance to him because of what he witnessed at Mount Suribachi. In that spirit tonight, we used the American flag to decorate uh, the, uh, the covering for the plaques outside for what will be dedicated as the Berman Conference Room. Hesh said that the historical flag raising on Iwo Jima caused him to reflect on the ideals and institutions our flag represents, the necessity to protect and preserve these principles, and his desire to transmit these sentiments to generations of youngsters. As I stood at the Doughboy last week at our own Memorial Day ceremonies, I remembered that a few years ago, we dedicated a monument to honor the Jewish war veterans, and Hesh was the featured speaker at that dedication. It's an enduring memory for me. Although the day was warm, Hesh recounted many personal experiences and reflections on his service, and what that meant to him and many veterans like him. And I remember thinking his speech was extraordinary, not just because of what he said, but because, as I recall, he'd not been feeling too well before the speech. Yet there he was, as if he was the healthiest person in the world. He was truly in his element when he spoke. He knew that other Jewish war veterans were counting on him to make sure that their story was heard and the fight retold to ensure that the appropriate respect and honor was given for the many sacrifices of these veterans. Hesh rose to the occasion. He spoke passionately and eloquently that day. As, it, as I had seen so many times before, that was his way of doing things. He enjoyed being with people, and if he had something that he felt needed to be said or done, he drew strength from that, and the people that he knew were counting on him. Rising to the occasion meant having the courage of his convictions, which is something that requires the toughness that characterized Hesh. Today in the vernacular, we call it stepping up. To Hesh, it was a way of life. And you saw courage rising to the occasion in everything that Hesh did. That's what athletes do. That's why Hesh saw it as his duty to volunteer for the Marines. Rising to the occasion, that's what Marines do. That's what good parents do, as Beachy and Bruce, who is here tonight, will attest. Caring, kindness, rising to the occasion. It's what devoted husbands do. Jocelyn clearly enabled, it, it, it's what devoted husbands do. Jocelyn shared her life with Hesh. They had their triumphs and trials, but Jocelyn clearly enabled and ennobled so much of what Hesh did. So while we remember Hesh tonight, we must take time to thank Jocelyn, Bruce, and Beachy for sharing Mr. Highland Park with us. Rising to the occasion, that's what leaders do. And they ask others to share a vision for how things ought to be. And that's what Hesh did. He ended his biography with this statement. My fervent wish is that Highland Park will remain the kind of community we help to make, and the inevitable changes that will come with time will help make it an even better place to live. And in keeping with our town's motto, locus bonus, meaning a good place to live. And that's how he ended his biography. We treasure Hesh's legacy. It's an honor to share a title and the responsibilities he had. We may approach this job differently. For example, as Beachy has teased me, I do not sleep here, at least I try not to. But Hesh's mentorship to me, if you will, is that legacy of creativity, resourcefulness, and humor. A commitment to do the right thing, but most importantly, I'd like to suggest that as a community, whatever challenges we face today and in the future, that we continue to rise to the occasion. There will be times when we agree, and there certainly will be times when we disagree, but let's always remember that we share that noble aspiration and character that was in Hesh's heart and his soul. Highland Park, indeed, is a very nice place to live. Okay, so uh, we can, I think what I'd like to do is, I'd, I'd like to ask the Berman family to join me in front of the dais, if they would, and then I'm, I've got a proclamation I'd like to present to the family, and then we'll go to the conference room and we can actually uh, unveil, if you will, uh, the plaque and uh, dedicate the conference room. second. OK, 
made this proclamation from the office of the mayor, whereas Harold Hesh Berman, dedicated lifelong resident and former mayor of Highland Park, and whereas Harold Hesh Berman was born in Highland Park in 1919 and lived in the borough throughout his entire life, and whereas Harold Hesh Berman was a member of the first graduating class of Highland Park High School, and whereas Harold Hesh Berman was the first Highland Park resident to volunteer for World War II, serving as a staff sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps, and whereas Harold Hesh Berman married Jocelyn Miller in 1948 and was a devoted father and role model to his son Bruce and his daughter Beatrice Rubin and supportive father-in-law to her husband Philip Rubin, as well as a loving grandfather to his grandson Matthew Schiff, and whereas Harold Hesh Berman was committed to his work as a master carpenter, owner of paint stores, a valued employee at the Superior Alloy Steel Company of Ohio for 20 years, and an employee at Jersey Professional Management until he was 90 years old. And whereas, in addition to supporting his family, Harold Hesh Berman dedicated his life to community service, including as president of the Highland Park Exchange Club, as well as, the Highland, as well as a Highland Park Borough Councilman, state commander of the Jewish War Veterans, and a founding member of the Labor Day Parktown outing. And whereas Harold Hesh Berman was a beloved mayor of Highland Park from 1976 to 1980, and 1984 to 1988, during which time he built the current Borough Hall, initiated the sidewalk replacement program, and designed the Highland Park Locus Bonus logo among a litany of accomplishments. And whereas Harold Hesh Berman was often referred to as Mr. Highland Park for his love and dedication to our community, he infused his service as mayor with passion and commitment as evidenced by his, con his constant work on behalf of the borough. Now therefore, I, Gary Minkoff, mayor of the borough of Highland Park, do hereby dedicate our Borough Hall Conference Room to forever be known as the Berman Conference Room to perpetuate the legacy, generosity, and devotion of Mayor Harold Hesh Berman. Okay, so before I turn the microphone off, you shouldn't be sitting down yet. This is my show now. <laughs> we have to go out there because we have the second part of this. Gary, you have a camera to record this? Okay, so whoever wants, please follow us. I'm gonna ask the Berman family to come first and the governing body to join me. Us, I should say. Watch the flag. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this plaque. Okay. So this is a picture that Jocelyn gave us of Hesh, and it says Harold Hesh Berman, 1919 to 2012, veteran, civil leader, distinguished resident. We just get the right distance. Lifelong resident of Highland Park, member of the first graduating class of HPHS. 1938, lettering in five sports. Played semi-professional football, World War II veteran, staff sergeant in the United States Marine Corps, survivor of Iwo Jima, commander of Jewish War Veterans, post 133 of New Brunswick, New Jersey, state commander of Jewish War Veterans, president and charter member of Highland Park Exchange Club, chairman of Park Town Outing for three years, member of the Highland Park Planning Board, councilman, two-term mayor, designed Highland Park Logos Bonus Council in 1968 to 1975, Mayor 1976 to 1980, and 1984 to 1988. Okay, and if I can have that flag, and what we did is I specifically asked for three. Okay, one is for each other. And one is for Jocelyn, where are you? And Bruce, one is for you. Okay. Here's the thing, we can't linger out here because we have more ceremonies inside. Then we're going to come out and take a break and then you can look at the plaque, chat with friends, family. Okay, so we just need to go back inside because we have a couple of police officers to swear in. 
The next, the next thing that we need to do is uh, we have two police officers that we are going to swear in tonight. So there are a couple of parts to this. The first is that I would like to ask our police chief and public safety director, Stephen Risco, to join me here, here I guess, uh, because I'd like to ask him just uh, to briefly explain the uh, rigorous uh, screening, selection, interview, hiring process that uh, our new officers had to go through, and then I will uh, officially swear them in. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to introduce you to our two new officers, police officers that we hired, uh, and we're going to be swearing them in. However, before we do, I just have to say uh, to the Berman family how happy I am. Uh, Mayor Berman was a very close friend of mine. And not only that, a mere 27 years ago, he was mayor when I was sworn in, as was the captain. He was the mayor, and I happened to see uh, the former borough administrator uh, in the back. Uh, he was uh, also part of it, so thank you, uh, uh, sir. Before I, I we administer the oath, I'll ask the officers to come up, uh, please, please come up. We had quite an extensive process. Uh, we advertised, we just started in the fall, we ad advertised for the, uh, uh, we accepted the first 100 applications, and that went in uh, less than two days, a day and a half that was taken up. Um, we had a written exam that was administered by the New Jersey State Association of Chiefs of Police. We had a physical agility performance test administered by Somerset County Police Academy. Um, those who passed both tests, uh, the, the scores were averaged and the list was made. And we interviewed the first 15, the top 15 candidates. From there, we narrowed it down to seven candidates and presented them to the Public Safety Committee, which is made up of members of Borough Council, Borough Administrator, and myself. From there, we made a selection, and uh, these are the two gentlemen that we did select. Uh, they were given a contingent offer based on a successful medical, psychological, and physical uh, uh, test. So here we are, after all of that. First gentleman right here is Mr. Brad Siegel. Mr. Siegel resides in Jamesburg, New Jersey. He attended Monroe Township High School, and he was awarded the Monroe Township High School Citizenship Award. He attended the University at Albany State University of New York, where he earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Criminal Justice with a concentration in Management and Information Technology Management. He graduated summa cum laude with a 3.83 GPA, and he was named to the Dean's List of Distinguished Students for all four years. While a student at Albany, Brad interned in their police department. He gained experience by riding along with sworn field training officers. He coordinated the Citizens Police Academy, and he also assisted the department in becoming an accredited agency. He is currently a recruit in the Mercer County Police Academy in West Windsor, New Jersey. He enrolled as an alternate route candidate. For those of you who may not know what an alternate route candidate is, it's an individual who, on his own, applies to an accredited police academy in the state and uh, pays his way, his own tuition. Uh, prior to being accepted, he has to do much of what I explained that we did for hiring. He took a written test, psychological test, physical agility test. There's certain educational uh, prerequisites required. It's, it's a, a rigorous program to get in, and he was able to get in there where he is currently uh, enrolled. He's scheduled to graduate August 2nd of this year, and he is here tonight with his mother, Eileen, and his father, Mark. And Eileen will be holding the Bible as the oath of office is administered by Mayor Gary Minkoff. Would you like your family to join you? Okay.
just I just go where they tell me. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever you All right, please repeat after me. I state your name. I Brad Siegel. Do soundly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully, impartially, and justly. That I will faithfully, impartially, and justly. Perform all of the duties of the office of police officer. Perform all the duties of the office of police officer. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States and in this state. And to the governments established in the United States and this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Chief, would you like to introduce our next officer, please? Uh, Brad, would you just like to say, say a few words? Okay. Sure. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I want to just first thank uh, Mayor Minkoff and, and Chief Risco, along with the rest of the command staff, Captain Golden. Um, it's a real honor. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, as we said, it's, it's a great place to live in, and really um, a place is, is only great because of the people that live there and work there and, and every person I've come across so far has, has truly welcomed me with opening arms and you know, I'm just so excited to be able to spend as much time as I can with all of you and make this a great place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our second candidate is Christopher DeCosta. Chris is married to his wife, Sarah. They have two children, Sophia, three years old, and Christopher, Jr., five months old, and they reside in Middlesex. Chris attended St. Joseph's High School in Metuchen. Uh, he attended Middlesex County College, and he graduated from Keene University in May of 2005 with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in History. Prior to his appointment this evening to the Holland Park Police Department, Chris was employed full-time at G4S Security Solutions in Cranford, New Jersey, and he has also been employed as a part-time dispatcher in our police department since February of this year. So we're losing a dispatcher, but gaining an officer here tonight. Chris is scheduled to attend a 24-week police basic training class at the Somerset County Police Academy beginning in July. Graduation is slated for December 19th, 2013. Chris is here tonight with his wife, Sarah, and his two children, Sophia and Christopher, and Sarah will be holding the Bible. Uh, as the oath of office is administered by Mayor Gary Minkoff. What did you say before I had? Who's taller than whom? <laughs> Sit around the table. You're shy. You can have my job if that would help you come out of your shelter. Okay. Uh, yeah, whatever's comfortable. Okay. I state your name. I, Christopher Costa. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully, impartially, and justly. That I will faithfully, impartially, and justly. Perform all of the duties of police of the office of police officer. To perform, perform all, all the duties of, of the according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will bear true faith and to the governments established in the United States and in this state. And to the governments established in the United States and this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. 
Congratulations. I'll just be real quick. I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for coming out. Um, all the guys on the police force, I've been working with you since February. Just a, a great group of guys. And uh, I'm very happy to be working at Highland Park. I thank Chief, Chief Rizgo, commanding staff as well. And uh, I'd like to thank my family as well, Sophia, my son CJ, and of course, my wife, Sarah, who's been uh, very supportive with me through this whole process. And I thank you. Thank you. Mayor, yeah. if, if I could just go back to uh, the Berman family, I want to assure you I should have mentioned, as you know, we're in the process of building a new police building, and out front was a, uh, a replica of our police patch made by Mayor Berman that is in safekeeping, and it is our intention to put it in our display case in the new building, so we thank him for that, and it will be prominently displayed there. Thank you. And thank you, uh, okay. so just before everybody goes, um, I'm sorry, were you done, Chief? No. Have we rehearsed this? <laughs> I think I'm on. I think if I wanted you to be done, you could be done, right? <laughs> but I don't want you to be done. Why don't you finish? Uh, I just wanted to welcome our new officers and let you know that you have the support of the entire department. As you can see, they all came out tonight for you. We welcome you, and we wish you a rewarding, successful career. So, thank you. Okay, I never had to juggle two of these at once before, but, oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to say to Brad and Chris, welcome again. And just since all of your colleagues are here, and I don't always get a chance to say this in front of them, um, I'll put it this way, as succinctly as I can, since we have yet a little more business that needs to be done tonight. And I just want to say that you are joining what I consider to be an absolutely extraordinary group of individuals, uh, the consummate professionals, and I am sure that you're up to the challenge and the task, and I'm sure that you'll all fit in beautifully together and continue to protect us and keep us safe. And I just want to say a collective thank you to the entire Highland Park Police Department for joining us tonight. And I want to congratulate you again, and I look forward to you working with all of us to keep Highland Park a very nice place to live. Okay, in yet another, in yet another departure from the usual format, um, I am going with the public's indulgence to uh, have a special session public comment for one group only. This will not interfere with our ability to have public comment later as needed. Uh, and then after that, we'll take a break for some refreshments. It's my understanding that there is a group in the audience, I believe, uh, a group of elementary school youngsters that would like to provide some public input on a traffic safety issue, if I understand this correctly. I think they're young activists in training. So I don't know who these people are, but if you would please come forward. Um, and if you need a microphone, I guess we can supply one so you can tell us who you are, why you're here, and uh, what we can do for you. Right there. My name is Mason, and I am nine years old, and I am in third grade at Bardo Elementary. My, f I, my friend and I are here to ask for speed bumps on Denison Street for, sa for safety, safety of Highland Park citizens. I think we should have speed bumps on Denison Street for many reasons. First, there are 27 children who live on Denison between 4th and 5th, right where I live. Then, then and we could run, run, we could get run over cars go really fast. Cars, also, we are very close to the high school, and, and when the high school kids are going and coming back, they could get hit, too. There is also a synagogue on this block, and people cross the street when there are not enough 
There's not enough parking in the lot and they could get hit. For that reason, me, me, Mrs. Springer Lipton, and my two friends, Aris, Aris Sol, and Daniel Gates, went around to ask people to sign a petition about the speedboat, uh, speedboat was on my block. And we got 60 signatures in only two days. I have lots of friends on the street, and I have a little brother who I love very, very much, and I get, and I get really scared when they drive fast on my street that someone will get hurt. So I think it's a very good reason to put speed rooms on Denison Street, especially if you care about kids. My name is Arie Saul, and I'm nine years old, and I'm also in third grade at Bartle School. I think there should be speed bumps on Den Denison Street because our pe people go on our street to escape Raritan rush hour. Rush hour. I don't like that because it scares me that all the cars go really fast, and I worry that they will go that w they will get out of control. My, in my opinion, I think we should have speed bumps because my friend almost got ran over. His name is Danny. I personally don't like it. Sometimes when my soccer ball goes in the street and when I go to get the car zoom past and even the dust flies out. I even usually don't look safely when I cross the street, but sometimes I don't notice and the car's, the car's zooming past. I also care about all my friends on the block and I don't want to hurt, hurt get to get hurt or die. That's why I'm asking you to put speed bumps on Denison Street between 4th and 5th. Do you gentlemen have a petition that you would like to give to me? Um, yes. Thank you. I'm going to give this to Councilman Patrick Millay who oversees public works, and I'm going to ask them to consult with the Public Safety Committee and our police chief, and um, hopefully we'll have some good news for you soon. Where's the chief? Oh, there you are. Hopefully we'll have some good news for them soon. Um, I would like to commend you on your composure, your professionalism, the extent of the research that you conducted, and I think that you are already demonstrating that you are model citizens, and I'm very proud to have you as residents of Highland Park, and I think there's much we can learn from you, so please come back and visit us again soon, okay? Thank you both very much. Okay, so now we're going to take a short break so that people can mingle. Those that don't want to stay for the rest of the meeting can go. There are refreshments right outside uh, outside this door on uh, this wall in the, in the hallway. So please, uh, if you're not staying with us or if you are staying with us, uh, we're going to take a break for a few minutes, enjoy each other's company and some refreshments. Okay, everybody's more or less here, so why don't I call the meeting back to order. Well, I thought that was very nice and a very fitting tribute to Mayor Berman and his family. And um, certainly we welcome our new police officers. And I would like to thank those of you who came uh, for whatever purpose uh, while you were wait. Um, you know, all of us have busy schedules, so I'm grateful that uh, folks cared enough to come out for Mayor Berman. And for those of you that have other business that you have with the governing body, thank you for uh, letting us pay tribute to Mr. Highland Park. Okay, so uh, do we have a Main Street Minute tonight? I don't think we do. So I'm going to dispense with that. Actually, you have to vote on number five and number six. Number five and number six. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so I administered the oath of office. You did that. Yes. Um, Ed, can we consolidate this? Yes, sir. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. So I administered the oath of office to uh, Officer Siegel and to Officer DaCosta. So I'm going to ask for uh, a motion uh, to adopt the resolution to hire both officers. This is 61385 and 61386. So can I have a motion? Motion to adopt. Second. Okay, can I have a roll call, please? Councilwoman Bro Mittler? Yes. Councilman Erickson? Yes. Councilman Millay? 
Yes. Councilman Potts? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Okay, so I've already dispatched with the Main Street Minute, so if Jamie's here, he's not speaking. <laughs> okay, uh, council reports. Uh, let's start with Councilman Potts. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. First, I just want to thank uh, a special, give a special thank you to Councilwoman Elsie Dublin Foster. I know she's not here this evening, but she uh, played a major part in organizing a wonderful Memorial Day celebration, uh, which included the dedication of the Fallen Heroes Way uh, located on Madison Avenue on the north side of Highland Park. And I also want to thank uh, everyone who helped uh, in making that day's events uh, go so smoothly. Also want to uh, congratulate uh, Ashton Burrell on a successful second annual uh, live uh, mentorship kickball game, which was held on Sunday, May 26th. Uh, Councilwoman Els uh, Susie Walkovitz and I were fortunate enough to be the uh, kickoff of the uh, kick ball game, I guess you'd say. Susie was the pitcher and I happened to be the first kicker, so we didn't uh, stumble and had a good time that day with uh, Ashton's event. Tomorrow night is our annual Senior Citizens Prom and that's going to be held at the uh, Senior Youth Center and that runs from 5 to 8 and the uh, title of this year's theme is Dancing Under the Stars. Also want to mention that we, of course, every year we have our camp program and the information is available. Uh, at the Senior Rec Center, uh, as well as on our website as well. We have day camps for, eight, uh, for grades K through six, a sports camp program for grades three through nine, and a teen camp this year from grades seven through 12. Those camp programs start on July 8th. And just so everyone knows, the, uh, you need to register before June 28th without incurring a late fee for registration of those camp programs. And then finally, our annual uh, 4th of July, which is going to be held on July 7th, actually, our fireworks festivities. Uh, the fireworks themselves will actually begin at 9.15 that evening, uh, but festivities actually begin at 3.30 in p.m. down at Donaldson Park. And uh, there will be plenty of music activities and uh, demos, food and beverage uh, on July 7th. And I encourage all our residents to uh, come out on July 7th to those fireworks. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Wilkowitz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just two things, but they're important. Uh, along with other sidewalk improvement projects in the borough, I'm delighted to report that the library sidewalks have been repaved. Uh, and um, the other item is that uh, through our Mayor's Wellness Campaign, we are announcing a new walking program. Uh, we we're planning on doing one walk a month. Um, we're having them during the week in the evenings. Uh, we hope that people can make it, uh, as opposed to Sunday where everybody seems to cram everything in. Uh, so we're doing some, some theme walks, and what we have planned so far is on July 23rd at 6.30 p.m., a walk through the trails in the meadows, which are near our public works department down by the park, and that's going to be hosted by Alan Williams. And on August 22 at 7 p.m., we're going to have an architecture theme walk that's going to be hosted by Highland Park architect Steve Busby. If you're interested, please uh, let us know. Joan, if that, would that be okay? Um, contact our borough clerk. Thank you. Thank and, you. and we'll be announcing more, more of that uh, officially on, on through the e-newsletter and, and other outlets. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bill Mittler. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just one quick thing. Um, our Main Street organization recently received a grant for $4,100 from the Cultural Heritage Foundation. And um, I think you'll be able to see the fruits of this over the next few months. That's it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Councilman Erickson? Yes, one thing. On June 15th, which is Saturday, uh, from 11 to 1 p.m. at the Avenel Middle School in, uh, on Woodbine Avenue in Avenel. There's going to be a meeting of the Central Region of Building One New Jersey. Uh, we have been, uh, Susie and I have been participating with Building One New Jersey. It's a group of inner uh, suburbs uh, like us, Metuchen, Maplewood, uh, Franklin, who are interested in developing policies and programs that uh, will help rejuvenate and stabilize communities. It's, uh, it's an active partnership between a number of towns and a number of churches. Uh, if people are interested in going, we expect somewhere between two and 300 people to attend. 
If they're interested in getting more information, they can contact me at Erickson HP, which is E-R-I-C-K-S-O-N HP at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to give them information about it. Thank you. Councilman, Council President Malay. No report. Thank you. I just have one item, because you've heard plenty from me tonight already. Uh, I just want to speak very briefly about uh, the water outage last week. Uh, first of all, uh, the water main break occurred over on Montgomery Street, one of our 16-inch mains. Unfortunately, this particular main appears to be uh, vulnerable. It's probably the best way to describe it. Uh, it's not the first time it's broken. I can't assure you that it's the last time that it will break, um, but uh, that's not the passive attitude that we're taking. Uh, a couple of things. One, I've asked our administrator, uh, our representatives from Middlesex Water, our public works people, to put their heads together and determine what a permanent fix could look like and what that would cost. Um, obviously, it's a major feeder line to the town, so there could be, could be a significant expense. We're trying to get our arms around what the definition of significant would be, and um, we're happy to keep you abreast of that. The other aspect to that from a communication perspective is uh, there's always a balance that we try to strike, which is that we want to give you timely information, we want to give you proactive information, and we want to give you accurate information. So, um, of course, as Murphy's Law would have it, uh, on our summer schedule, the first Friday, lo and behold, we have a water main break. So uh, I know people tried to reach the police station. Uh, we got uh, word out via Facebook, uh, our uh, reverse 911 system, our website as quickly as we possibly could. Uh, without pointing fingers, let's just say that there were a couple of elements to the water boil advisory which required specific language from the Department of Environmental Protection, which kind of, if you'll pardon my choice of words, hamstrung us. So. Again, that's not the place blame. Uh, that was language that we were previously not aware of, and our water provider would not let us send out these messages until we had some clarification on that issue. Uh, so we believe we've ironed that out. I also had a direct conversation with some people from Middlesex Water because a few phone calls went over there and there was some confusion about the information that they provided or wouldn't provide or whatever else the case might be. So I just want to let you know that um, we don't take any of this for granted. Just because it happens doesn't mean it has to happen again the same way. Uh, and we always want to do better. So in the interest of continuous improvement, I just wanted to let you know that I think all involved uh, did their very best and did an admirable job to manage the situation. The water was back on in a little less than an hour. Probably could have been sooner if we didn't have a car that was parked right in front of the valve that we needed to turn on to restore water pressure. That's going to happen sometimes. Notwithstanding that, thank you to everybody who was involved in getting the word out quickly and accurately. And um, whatever we do well, we're looking to do better. So I just wanted to make mention of that, and once again, I see that I skipped right over the Borough Administrator's report, who is not here. And Borough Attorney, do you have a report for this evening? No report. I didn't think you did. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, I am going to open the floor for public discussion. Uh, what I would say is I know that we have um, some residents here from uh, the neighborhood around Cleveland Avenue uh, with an interest, I think, in the Mount Royal litigation. So I just want to ask, is there anybody that has some public comment or question that doesn't relate to that? Okay, that's per, you do? Mrs. Bickhart. I'm sorry. Oh, Mrs. Bickhart. Okay, so I'm going to let Mrs. Bickhart speak first, and then we're going to take everybody else's questions and comments. Uh, there's a microphone over here, if you could give Mrs. Bickhart that. Contracted. Do we know where we are in this process? We're <laughs> still out to bid. What do you call okay. that? Well, we're about to go out to bid. Yes, we have been able to take in all of the measurements, and all of the bid specifications have been prepared, and we are waiting for the bids to come back. We're we haven't gone out oh, to bid. Oh, we haven't gone out to bid, but we're going out shortly. Uh, and we plan to uh, follow whatever legal procedures we need to follow. Uh, we will go out to bid, and uh, we'll then make a decision based on the bids that come back. Uh, I assume we'll award a contract, but you never know. It depends on whether or not there's a uh, bid which fulfills all of the requirements. Uh, and then we'll communicate with the public about the appropriate next steps. The properties that were marked last year, and many of them have been repaired, mm -hmm. but there are other properties that were not marked at all. What about those? Are you going to have somebody else go out again? That should have been marked, but weren't. 
Well, unfortunately, since the Borough Administrator is not here, I can't answer that question specifically. However, I can assure you that if somebody has a sidewalk, we inspected all the sidewalks in Highland Park last year. So if we miss something or if something changed, I can't necessarily speak to that. But as far as I know, everybody else's sidewalks were looked at as part of this program. Don't hold me to that, but that's my understanding. In my neighborhood, on my street, all the ones that were marked, people repaired privately. On Fort South Fourth, all the ones that were marked were also repaired, but there was damage to other ones that were not marked and therefore were not repaired. So, and they should have been repaired. Because people, I've seen somebody fall on there because there was a two, almost a two, minute, two inch gap. Um, I walked down Madison Avenue from the Central School all the way to Cleveland Avenue, and I had to walk during this downpour we had uh, last week one day because I couldn't walk on the sidewalk because the branches from once you pass the Center Street all the way down almost you know, either sidewalks were overgrown and people had beautiful flower beds or the trees, young, many of them were young trees, were so low, and I'm only 5.1, um, you couldn't walk under them without getting a shower. So somebody needs to take a look at that. Council President Malay, when he meets with the Public Works Committee and the Shade Tree Advisory Committee can have that conversation with what, them. One of the things that we're doing in addition, we get money f from different sources and it goes into the, the tree fund, but what we're also going to be doing is making sure that at least a part of that money goes into ongoing maintenance. Much, it's, I have a similar situation with shade trees in, around my house, and I'm, I back out my car and I hit the tree and the branch, you know. So it's, there's a, it's a maintenance that has to be done to upkeep it. We're trying to develop kind of a funding stream that, that is separate, let's say, from the tax base. Well, who's responsible for maintaining? I mean, the town. If shade trees, if it's in the verge, it's, it's okay. yeah. Well, technically, it's all you know. That is, uh, you know, our right of way. But I, I assume it's that it was put in there by the the individuals. So, if it's blocking the sidewalk, then that's an issue to be brought up to the code enforcement. And you'll, yeah. we'll follow up on that. And that was on North Second. No, no, no. Uh, it was Madison. Okay, Madison. Madison. Right. I said from the school. You want to write that down? No, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, other public discussion? Adasa Garrett's 49 Cleveland Avenue. I would just like to know, um, the first part of my question is to, to ask what's been going on with American properties. Um, I know there's litigation, but well, I don't know what's going on with that, and we'd like to know what's going on with that because um, I know the, um, there's been a settlement with the property behind my house on Cleveland Avenue, um, and that could potentially increase the traffic by uh, 188 cars, which is close to 200. And if, if uh, the um, borough uh, caves into the, um, the, the lawsuit that American Properties has, then we could potentially have another 300 cars. And we already have over 2,000 cars going up and down Cleveland Avenue. And we're sometimes backed up we can't turn onto River Road for, you know, at least two or three minutes, sometimes five. So if we're adding another, you know, 500 cars um, a day, that's at rush hour, it's going to be really bad. So I hope that the borough will try to resist the uh, litigation as much as they can and, uh, you know, have a lower density than what they want. Okay, so let's, I'm going to... I'll answer these first, and let's see if that addresses the issue, and then if other folks need to add, we'll go from there. Um, and I'll rely on Ed, perhaps from a procedural, procedural perspective. Uh, some of you may know that there was a meeting with some of the residents uh, out of the site in American Properties recently. Uh, that wasn't so much uh, because I wanted to argue with Randy Chick in public. It was because I felt that it was important as the, uh, some of the residents, many of the residents, to engage directly with 
uh, our special master, Betsy McKenzie, as well as with the developer, Randy Trick, to express your concerns. And I was grateful that you did that. And um, I realized that there are some things that Randy said which frustrated you. Um, rest assured, I heard everything that you had to say, and we have reiterated uh, on s multiple occasions um, whatever our positions are, uh, which litigation, unfortunately, prohibits me from getting into. But I do want to uh, emphasize a couple of things. One, um, as far as the settlement with the property directly behind you, uh, as best I understand it, our, uh, our efforts are intended, once this is out of the planning board, to go to Middlesex County and explore the, uh, the uh, I think it's going to be a right in, right out, yes, Ed? Uh, at the end of uh, that's the intention. At the end of the development. So while that may not alleviate the traffic I, problem, I speak to the, yeah. the actual proposal that p before the planning board has a full access uh, driveway. So all traffic or the m vast majority of this newer development will go out directly to River Road and not go on to Cleveland or uh, Harrison. I mean, some will that choose to go, but I think the the way the and you could the, there before the planning board. The third Thursday of this month, I'm not sure exactly the date, maybe it's the 20th, so you can get a look at the, their exact proposal and how the, uh, the, the streets are aligned and you can see for yourself that the ma vast majority of the traffic will most likely go down directly to River Road. No. No, there's going to be, it, again, it will have its own access off of River Road. Right, it, it will have its own access. Um, with all due respect, um, if they uh, want to get anywhere in town, the south side, north side, they're going to go out north, the, yeah, the exit onto North 2nd. They're not going to go to River Road and deal with that traffic and then take a left back up Cleveland to get to, into town or to Route 1 or whatever if, tra if traffic is bad. The only way that they could would go get onto exit onto River Road is if they want to go to Metuchen or if they want to get onto 18 South and the Turnpike that way, which is only good when it's not rush hour because most residents know it makes more sense to get onto Route 1 South to, to 18 or the, and the turnpike. So I really, I, I know it's wishful thinking to think that they're going to all exit onto River Row, but I really don't think that's going to happen. I think well, at least 50% or more, maybe 75% will go out the North Second uh, entrance. Well, um, since I, I, I guess all I can say is I, I don't know how to quantify other than what the traffic engineers have studied, and I respect and know that a number of residents in the neighborhood have, have counted cars and provided us with that information, which we have shared uh, with our planner, with our attorneys. Uh, and um, I don't want this to sound dismissive. Uh, the governing body and everybody involved in this process, at least from the borough's perspective, is very sensitive to the potential safety and congestion and noise impacts associated with traffic. So our desire is, as part of this process, to try to, and I realize that, you know, that gets into the issue of density and it gets into a lot of other issues. And so we understand, again, I'm not saying that to placate. I'm saying as an acknowledgement, we recognize that, we appreciate it, and we're doing our very best to manage those circumstances as part of both what happened in the original settlement and what may or may not ultimately happen with American properties. Uh, other questions or comments? So we'll have you go after. Okay. Mary Curran, 67 Cleveland Avenue. And I just wanted to speak perhaps emotionally tonight. It was an emotional night to begin with, um, honoring the former mayor. And so I just wanted to go back and uh, talk about this idea of the legacy of what our decision will be for this community of Highland Park. And we were very appreciative for you, um, our mayor, and many of the council people who met with us and worked with us on the lower parcel. And we felt like our voices were heard. We felt like you were working together with us. And I have to say, from my perspective, I don't know about the rest of the community members, but for the upper parcel, we really haven't felt that way. We felt like we've been kept at arm's distance. Um, there's quite a bis bit of disappointment. You know from the beginning that we felt like you know the city had a master plan, there's a vision, there's an idea of what we'd like our community to be like. And suddenly, because of errors on behalf of the council, we were exposed to this litigation. And so we'd really like to plead that you continue to keep us involved to um, also work to everything you just said, you know, how you said you're listening and how you really want to take the safety, the density, the traffic 
into consideration. And unfortunately, I was one of the first people who met with Mr. Chick when we found out he was the one behind the whole thing. Uh, Lou Pitchinson and I went 18 months ago or something and spoke with him and never felt from then till now that he was listening, that he was willing to do much accommodating at all, that any changes, reduction of density was an issue. So, uh, you know, that leads to disappointment, resentment, all the things that Frustration. I just want you to know that we're feeling. And, you know, with the first parcel, we started out feeling that it could be potentially antagonistic, and it didn't result that way. We were able to come to some mutual agreement. And in this second scenario, really, you know, we've been kept at bay. We don't really know so much about what's happening. We understand because of legal re reasons you can't tell us much. But it's just been very um, difficult. So I think I covered what I want to say here. I just hope you think about your legacy like Mr. Mayor Berman. And, you know, it's a nice place to live here. We know it can continue to be. But the decisions we make today about what's go going in over there are what people from generations to now, when they name a new conference room or something after you, they'll be talking about your achievements <laughs> and what you've done for us. And, um, you know, I think this is a place where you can be very proud, as all the council people, of, you know, decisions that will affect us. Mary, thank you for your heartfelt sentiments. I just want to say, um, for whatever that's worth, since you, you directed that to me personally, I just must say, without sounding too glib, Nobody's naming a conference room after me any time. So I'm not too worried about that. In terms of, in terms of you know, certainly we're all on the governing body extremely cognizant of the, of the impact and, and both today and tomorrow. Um, but I, I certainly appreciate your sentiments, and I know that everybody on the governing body does. Uh, yes, sir, please. My name is Melvin Goodman. We live in 402 Grant Avenue in Highland Park. Sorry to say, I'm not sorry, but uh, I've just learned about what's going on over on Cleveland Avenue. We've been away a long time. We were down in New Orleans waiting for our grandson to graduate college from down there and only recently returned and found out about what's going on. My concern beside, obviously, is way behind everybody in terms of what I've learned here, but it seemed to me a piece of property that's going to be built, uh, expecting 250 units, would expect approximately 375 cars, one and a half cars per unit. I don't think that's an unreasonable estimation of what's going on with people. People having multiple cars is not an unusual thing anymore. The impact, of, to my mind, is what's going to happen to the, if you provide 250 cars, parking spaces, what are you going to do with the extra 175? Where are they going to spill over? Onto my dead end street on Grant Avenue, which is hard enough to come out now? Are they going to spill over onto Lincoln? Are they going to spill onto Harrison? What are you going to do about that? Or what are you planning about that? Or better yet, what are you insisting that the builders do about that in terms of providing excess parking space for, for the residents? Thank you. Well, again, there's a limit to what we can talk about because we're under a very strict set of restrictions from, from the judge. Um, the first thing I would like to clarify and I don't say this because it's more palatable, but just uh, to clarify, Ed, the official proposal that's in the public domain from American is how much right now? Well, their, their lawsuit is seeking 184 rental units in about five multi-family buildings on the seven and a half acres. That's yeah. their lawsuit. So I want to be clear. I'm not saying that that's desirable by any stretch, and I realize that that is undesirable to probably almost everybody in this room, uh, perhaps everybody in this room. Um, the only reason that I say that is, you know, just in terms of numbers, that's the starting point. So wherever negotiations are proceeding from, they're not up from the 180 to 250. We're trying to get that number down, okay? And we're also sensitive, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about ownership versus rental. I can't really get into that. Um, there is this thing called the Residential Site Improvement Standards, which governs how many parking spaces based on the actual number of units to, again, try to uh, address the concerns that residents would have to say, uh, well, if there's going to be X number of cars per unit, planners have calculations that are standards that would be required to be adhered to. Now, um, do plans always work out as expected? Do people park where they're supposed to in all circumstances? Do people have extra cars that the models don't account for? Absolutely. 
right? I mean, we, we know that the real world doesn't always mirror what the models say. At the same time, uh, without me getting into what I can't get into, uh, again, all I can say is that when, when we have had conversations with the developer, we have tried to make clear to them that we're a community of neighborhoods, this is a small town, we have a strong desire to do everything we can to preserve the quality of these neighborhoods, the quality of life in these neighborhoods, traffic, parking, congestion, noise, etc., and that whatever we can do to advocate in that regard, we absolutely have been doing with all the parties involved that have a role in this decision. So that includes the special master, it includes the attorneys on the other side, the principals as in Randy Chick himself, et cetera. Um, and I'm, again, I'm not saying that to be glib, I can't really talk more about this than that, but uh, even though I don't live over there and members of the governing body aren't necessarily in that neighborhood, we are keenly sensitive to these concerns. Uh, it may not seem that way, and I understand why it may not seem that way, but I can assure you that I've heard every one of these concerns that have been expressed. Patrick has joined me in these negotiations at various times, and we are doing everything we can to advocate for the kinds of issues that you're raising, the specific issues that you're raising, to try to keep this under control and reasonable. So I think I can say that. Yes, sir? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, uh, other questions or comments? Please give us your name and address. Uh, Israel Botnick, 309 Harrison Avenue. Um, <clears throat> about, I, I don't know if it was a year and a half ago or approximately, um, American Properties was here in this building and they gave a presentation about their plans. At the time being, their plans were, were um, to create units for sale. And I understand that that's not the case anymore. They're looking to do rentals, um, but since what they uh, peddled here was misinformation. W wouldn't it make sense for them to come back and, and re-present re what their current plan is? Well, they can't present the current plan, I don't believe, because the judge won't allow them. Uh, at the same time, uh, because nothing has been finalized, you know, in terms of this agreement, I mean, there's still ongoing discussion. We don't know where this whole thing is going to turn out. Uh, that doesn't mean that anything is off the table in terms of a discussion from our perspective. So I don't want to create hope that it will be a for sale project. I don't know if it will turn out to be one or it won't turn out to be one. Um, I've heard mixed reviews about that. There are a lot of people that feel very strongly that it should be units for sale. There are some people that would say, uh, I prefer to have lower density versus units for sale. Um, so there's, uh, you know, we hear both sentiments. In terms of them coming back, they will come back and make a presentation at some point, and I can defer to Ed in terms of what that would look like procedurally. But for the time being, again, you know, I'm not hiding behind the judge. The judge has given us very stringent orders about what we can and what they can discuss. So right now, the only thing that we can really talk about is what the current, quote, proposal is, and however that's been modified, that's been modified. So um, I don't know, Ed, do you want to add anything to what I just said? Well, as you point out, I mean, the current proposal is dramatically different than the plans that were rolled out several years, 18 months ago. Um, and, uh, and the developer has the right to pursue these new plans before the court, and that's what they're doing right now. Uh, we haven't agreed to those plans, of course, and we're still talking with them. And it's in the, what we call the discovery phase of the litigation. So our experts are talking to one another, doing reports, et cetera. But Right now, they have the right to uh, uh, demand, if you, uh, if you like, uh, uh, the different product, which now is a rental product in, in a series of multifamily buildings. And uh, we have the right to resist that, which we are doing. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%, just because of the misinformation that was given here. You know, there, there were a lot of people at that meeting. Well, I, uh, let me correct you. I don't believe at the time in other words, the plans that were presented now nearly two years ago, it's 2011 when these plans were presented, I, I, I do believe we have to understand that at the time they were talking about an ownership product and a series of townhomes. I mean, those were the plans that were presented. Uh, and then time has gone by and, and, and they've taken the position that the market is different and that they want to do rental project now, they don't want to do the ownership project. So I don't think they came in and intentionally presented plans which they never intended to pursue. I think at the time they were presenting plans that they, they had hoped to build and get approved. 
Uh, so I don't think it's a. Yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't saying okay. they lied. I, I was just saying that because there were a good number of people at that meeting, not that many people here, I, I don't know if people necessarily are aware of the change of plans. And if their current plans have changed, I don't see why they couldn't come and represent what their plans are so people can get a better understanding. I think transparency is usually a good thing. I would agree, but we're not close to agreeing to 184 units in a series of apartment buildings. We're not, we're not, we're not agreeing to that. In other words, on your behalf and on behalf of the borough, it, it, that wouldn't be a plan to roll out if we're vigorously objecting to that plan. And I, we could say we're vigorously objecting to that plan. We are vigorously objecting to that plan. And we've made those vigorous objections very clear to them directly. You know, I've, I've sat with Mr. Chick, and I've, <laughs> I don't want to over-dramatize. Let, let's just say that he knows how we feel about that plan, and um, we, we know how he feels about what we've said, and I can't really say more than that, but no, nothing, is, nothing is decided by any stretch of the imagination right now. Yeah, please. I just want to uh, point out to the public that while the negotiations can be uh, frustrating because of the lack of, uh, let's say, transparency, it is only through a negotiated settlement that we can, let's say, have all the, uh, or have some or all of the units be, like, for sale. We can have that part of the agreement. If we were to go to court and win, they could still build rentals or for sale depending on how they fit. There's no law that can make them do either or. We can also, through the negotiation process, uh, come up with concept plans and site plans that, like, say, lessen the impact, you know, or are better looking, which you could not do if you were simply to go through and go to trial. So while it may be frustrating and it's been time consuming and expensive for the borough, much like we were able to do with the, the lower portion, we can nail down important elements that, uh, you know, will be better in the long run. So that's why we're going through this process. Other questions or comments? I'm Mildred Skirbitz. I live at 14 North 4th Avenue for 50 years, and I think I'm an authority on the traffic. North 4th Avenue is a thoroughfare from River Road. Everyone turns off from down North 4th Avenue to Raritan Avenue to wherever they're going. And if the light is red on the corner, the traffic is backed up to Montgomery Street, even further down. And it's unfortunately, two or three cars get through when the light turns. But that's another story. But I can't even fathom more traffic coming in from all the additional cars that will be at this project, which I just learned of yesterday. But I thought I would put my two cents in. Thank you. Uh, Jane Ryan, 47 Cleveland. Um, I'm one of the residents that was able to attend the walkabout with um, Randy Schick and some of the council members and the, who else was there? Um, it, oh, Betsy McKenzie. Um, number one, thank you very much for setting this up and making it happen. Um, a few things that were very concerning that came out of that, at least for me, um, the primary one was Randy Schick's assertion that he had to make very dense housing to be able to afford to develop this lot because it was a site under environmental remediation. Um, to me, what he was essentially saying is, I've decided to buy a really crappy piece of land, and because I want to develop this, I want you to pay for it. And you know, the way we're paying for it is through density and I, did, I just don't think this is, you know, our responsibility to pay for his bad, for us to pay for his bad investment. So that was the primary thing. That has no standing in court, so well, you know, that's more of his, that's a negotiating point. His, his arrogance? Well, I'll just say that. <laughs> well, if you say it, it's one thing. If we say it, it's different, so. Larry Perfetti, 214 Cleveland Avenue. My concern coming out of that meeting was uh, that Mr. Chick specifically said that he changed from residential to rentals. You mean for sale, Larry? For sale, yeah. 
to, to yeah, okay. Sorry. Like, from for sale to rentals, because there was a problem with pollution, the source of which we could not determine, and uh, the remediation for which he was not willing to pay completely, whether or not he's actually paying. At first, he started saying that Honeywell was paying, and he said he, would pay. you know, my sense is Honeywell's paying, and he's giving us baloney. But in any case, I am concerned at this particular time to know what the pollution is in that area, because pollution doesn't stay in one area. And pollution does not necessarily leach down. It can leach up into our houses, my house being 150 feet away from that property. Uh, and I also think that it's something that needs to be brought to the court's attention that this man is saying rental people don't have to know about the pollution on this property the way people who are going to buy uh, residences do. Uh, kind of throwing away human life there, is, you know, it's kind of questionable to me. But for the people, for us who are already there, I would like to know from, from you guys what the pollution is, you know, what danger or not non-danger we're in, what the remediation is, when this, what the timetable is all about. And what can we say about that? Well, the, um, uh, the distinction between <clears throat> what you have to tell people what you have to tell people when they buy is called a deed notice. So if you have a polluted piece of property and it's being cleaned up and you're going to sell that to people, you have to put a specific disclaimer and a big notice on the deed to explain that. That was what was causing him concern if he was going to market the property as ownership as opposed to rental units. I think that's what he tried to tell us out at the site. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the cleanup, uh, I think you're absolutely right. It, Honeywell is taking the lead and in, in, in probably 100% or 90% of cleaning up the property. Most of it, as we understand it, is uh, groundwater pollution. There are a series of monitoring wells out there. Uh, whatever's developed on that property won't live off of well water anyway. It's going to be on city water, so you don't have to worry about that. But we're told that Honeywell, and periodically they will come in and they will brief the council and the mayor about the status of the cleanup activity. And they're committed to it. They have to in order to be able to sell the property. Uh, so uh, as far as we know, there are no uh, problems with, with the pollution coming up and spreading to your property. It's all in the groundwater and going down. The only unknown is eventually the slab that we were standing on has to be broken up taken up and then those areas tested and then treated if there's any soil there. And just like on the lower piece, if there's soil there that's contaminated, then Honeywell probably would have to dig it out, take it to Delaware to be treated and replace it with clean soil. That's exactly what they did on the lower piece before they can get any permits from us to go build. And they have to do that after they get their approvals. And the DEP would require Verify. They'd have to come in and verify right. all that they as had well, to get right? Cleared by the state DEP. What are the pollutants? Do you know what the pollutants? Well, it was an old industrial site, Larry. So I'm sure that there were some, you know, chemicals or something went out the window, or as they were spray painting, or the uh, the the illuminating process, uh, you know, created some uh, items that hit the hit the soil, and then after it rained, it went into the groundwater. So it's mostly a below soil groundwater problem. You know, the aquifer is down there. It runs through all the bright broken shale. And, and it can't go, and they don't want it to go places. So they're monitoring it, and they're trying to aerate it and clean it up. Probably going to take, I think they told us the other day, probably take 100 years before that soil, I mean that water, is clean. But if you're not going to use the water, and if it's not going off to harm anybody else, DEP says continue to aerate it, continue to test it, and clean it. And, and, ca and, ca and cap it, right? He specifically said that he didn't know the source, or we don't know, I'm not going to keep saying the we, but that he didn't know the source of the pollution. Uh, he couldn't determine where it was on the property, and which led me to think, well, okay, if it's up there high, my house is below the high. Mm -hmm. yeah. And water runs down, and so is the rest of the block down from the high of that building. That is the peak. Uh, of, of our block. You're saying the slab? That, 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 the, that particular part of the property 
is the peak on our block so that water would run down Cleveland Avenue both ways mm -hmm. and away over toward you know all the other streets. So water runs, we all know that. And we cannot, I mean, sit here and certify that there, oh, there is no pollution up at the top. If there is pollution up at the top and it's waterborne, that is the, that is the apex of our block. And as I think it's the apex of the north side. I, I think it would be good for everybody. We will, I think we can get the, the uh, environmental impact reports and make them public because they could more clearly e explain what's going on than, you know, uh, we could. Uh, my understanding, though, is that it is, in a sense, in the groundwater, which means it's in the water table that is contaminated, not the soil or anything, and um, that with, you know, proper capping and monitoring it, that it should be fine. But I will get, you know, make sure we have the copies of the various reports so people can, you know, see and read, you know, for themselves. I want to, I mean, Very, you know, at various times there, the building, there's been various. Sure. You know, and it will get you the most up-to-date information that we have. Groundwater does not mean down at the bottom of the ground only. Groundwater could be, what I'm saying, on in the ground at the apex. Right. Of but our what ground. I think they are referring to is water that is in, in a sense, the bedrock. They, they won't certify that. That's what I want to know. Okay. Is it, all, is it up there, too? And if it is up there... I, I don't have a specific answer to that specific no, question. Yeah. But, we, 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 but we certainly, to the extent that we're allowed, we're happy to share whatever we can, you know, uh, because I, I everybody see, should know. I can't see how that, uh, you know, falls on the case at this point. It shouldn't. Time. This is a health concern. Right. Uh, it's yeah. whatever, not, whatever information will be public information, right. you know, two uh, on these Two things. other things. One, thank you for my dog and for me. You know the cut throughs for being the cut throughs. So oh, I forgot to mention that. Be, yes, that 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 that's really nice. Really and that that was a uh, a state grant. I'm sorry, Patrick. Patrick. Your council report was over. I know. And, <laughs> and the other thing is, again, we are counting on coming you. from you. Continue I talk too much. Right? <laughs> to turn turn his mic off. Would you? <laughs> to continue to fight for the proper density in, the, in that area, density that fits into our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank Other you. comments? I am Dmitry Shvashnikov, 45 Plymouth Avenue. Um, I don't know how developments work, but uh, is there talk of a tax abatement if, if this is developed or how that work? No. So they would not have tax abatements at all? Um, not, that, not that I've heard. That, that hasn't come up. Uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, just one more comment to build on what, what Mary said. Um, it seems like we're the best. Uh, Hang on just one second. Can we? I just want to put that to rest because I have heard that on a few occasions that there are you know, people that have this perception, rightly, wrongly, whatever, that sometimes it happens that way or there are tax breaks given to the developer. Um, you know, that's not something that we're interested in. I mean, if it has to be built, I mean, we're not looking at, I don't want to say like we're, we're looking to just, and it, there are a couple of perceptions here, right? One is, well, then max out the rateable by maxing out the density. Okay? So, um, that's not necessarily something that we've looked at where we say, well, then let's just go for the biggest rateable that we can find, which is one fear that people would obviously have based on what I just said. And the second one is that from a tax standpoint, um, if there's something that's going to be built there, you know, I, I've talked about, and I know it sounds, I called myself the politician earlier, from the first day I've been on the council, we've tried to talk about responsible rateables. You know, that ideally numbers that can work in that neighborhood advise us on what we think those are and those are numbers that we'd be interested in that doesn't have to be the max no uh, wherever that comes out we don't know but it just it, to be very clear on that point uh, you know we're not negotiating in 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 that vein at all where like well you know either for a, a bonus one way or the other or something like that I mean that has not been part of the conversation and it's not to my understanding I'm not the attorney at the table here to my understanding, it's also not a requirement of Mount Laurel. Okay. That's, okay. Not, that's what I was going to say, because it seems like um, a, a lot of things that, you know, we did throw you guys, such as traffic studies or pollution studies with, with, uh, with Larry, um, they're very tangible and very subjective, and it seems like pretty much every single time, the Mount Laurel kind of overshadows everything and then kind of goes away. And like we understand that you guys are working behind, like behind the scenes for us, but in the previous projects, when um, we kind of had a say, whether it be like, you know, some communication with Serenian or things that, you know, 
Luto for a few people. It just seems that it kind of moved the product. I mean, at the end, it moved very fast. And you gotta admit, it did move fast. And you know, we got what we wanted and everything got what we wanted. And it seems like that card is off the table at this point, and I know it's for judges' orders, but it seems like uh, what, what the community wants has been kind of cut out. So I just. Uh, well, you know, again, I can understand because of the. Um, I use the term that uh, Rabbi Botnick used before, you know, the quote, lack of transparency. You know, I said probably at a council meeting last February, I don't know, I mean, we could check the minutes, but it was early last year, it was relatively early in my tenure as mayor. I said, I understand the frustration of the opacity here. You know, I'm, I may not be living with it, obviously. I mean, so I realize that may seem like a, uh, a contradiction of sorts, and, and I, paradox is probably a better way to put it, and I appreciate that. Um, we can only tell you what we can tell you. You know, um, people will believe that we're listening or we're not, and I understand that too, and I respect that too. Um, I, I certainly hear everything that's being said. I hear everything that, that Randy is saying. You know, I'm processing everything. We're synthesizing everything. We have done our utmost to represent each and every one of these concerns to him. You know, where that's going to come out, we don't know. Um, you, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. I can understand why you wouldn't. I can only tell you that you know we are, we are in there representing every one of these concerns as effectively as we possibly can in every, each and every one of these discussions. And, and we do appreciate it. I know you guys probably put a lot of laws that you know, pretty much have our head. But um, so if you could just kind of remind the judge how fast it did go once we kind of started talking with Ephraim. I mean, it'll, I'm sure he's interested in expediting this whole thing. I'm not sure if you can play that part or not. But uh, we do want to start developing just more responsibly. Just, just to point out, uh, Ephraim settled because he had no standing in court and would have lost. Yeah, that's that's why he settled. He made, it, he made a good deal, and, and that's great, but the, the reason he made the deal and settled so quickly because if we had taken him to court, we would have won, and he knew that, and he made the best deal that he could because he had a weak position in court. The other de this developer has a stronger position, and that's why we've been going at it for so long. I understand, but I think once we I got just want to point that out. Once we got Ceradian, which was having, even having you move, mm -hmm. things got a little better. Yes. Okay, so just in terms of uh, organization, uh, I saw a few people who haven't spoken yet. I think Mr. Uh, Goodman, right, uh, wanted to speak again. So I just, whoever would like to speak, Mr. Goodman, if you don't mind, if you've already spoken, then, you know, before we quote, lap the field, I just want people who haven't yet spoken to have the opportunity to do so, okay? Uh, yeah, who is next? Bobby and then uh, Diane, I know, also wanted to speak. Bobby Kumar, 442 Zero Avenue. And I'm here like the others to speak by the American Properties and the former Lumen Experience. Sorry, 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 sorry. We need you to slow down, enunciate. Sorry. Is the mic on? I'm sorry. It's them, it's not me. I, yeah, I, yeah, that's better. I'm here like the others to speak about the American properties on the former Lumine Experience parcel on Cleveland Avenue. I'd like to start by stating that my family and I live on the opposite side of town from this proposed project, and I'm coming here as a concerned citizen of Highland Park. This administration has a civic duty to the public safety and well-being of current and future residents of our town. I think most of us can agree that this site is ill-suited for residences. It is on grade level with the Northeast Quarter train tracks, which are known to be one of the most traveled upon lines in New Jersey and carry with this the effects of noise pollution and safety considerations. There are no environmental considerations on the site location as well, and it's close proximity to high voltage transmission towers and the dangerous effects of these electromagnetic fields to future residents, which has been reviewed and studied by both the World Health Organization, along with many domestic and, domestic and international public safety organizations, all of which have issued general guidance against the mounting, mounting scientific research and have promoted cautionary response to the potential risk of long-term EMF exposure. This particular development would be the closest proximity to families of any parcel in Highland Park to these high voltage towers. I imagine that the developer is also acutely aware of these issues and that these are the primary drivers behind their proposal for jamming in as many families into the site location. The developers have clearly laid out their best interests, which is not in affordable housing or the well-being of future residents. They are looking for the density to serve their singular purpose of maximizing their profits. Their development the developer has not demonstrated any hardship or need in their requested number of units, other than ensuring their investment yields, which I wholeheartedly agree on is their job, but should not be the town's burden at the expense of future residents. 
They've stated and they've justified their density requirements are necessary to pay for the remediation of the current environmental concerns. Why does the town have to pay for the price for their remediation costs and their sales agreement? They've also stated that owner-occupied would never work since no one would invest in a property built over this type of pollution. How can they and you as the administration view this environmental risk as suitable for renters? Renters should not be treated as disposable class of people and the notion that environmental are not relevant to them is an insult to these future families. We serve the duties our town's watchdog for current and future residents and the notion that we should acquiesce to a developer and not question the practicality of their request and its effect on our communities are responsible. I am certainly aware of the complexities of the case in front of you and that is highly nuanced and carries significant consideration, including the builder's remedy lawsuit and ultimately the best use of the site location. I am also aware that at this time we may or may not have an ability to address the use of this site as residential versus commercial or light industrial through the terms of the court master. However, we do have an ability to address the absolute number of units we allow this developer and we do have an opportunity to at least mitigate the number of families exposed to these adverse conditions. Just because they can and they want doesn't mean they should. And this, Mr. Mayor and Council, is your social and ethical responsibility to the current and future families of Highland Park. We may be a small town, but we are a great one too. A town of teachers, artists, tradesmen, Nobel Prize winners, and most importantly, a town that is not afraid of bullies. And since bullies only respond to strength, I am respectfully asking you to continue to aggressively fight this issue to lower the units demanded by this development and the number of potential residents exposed to these conditions. Thank you. I appreciate your use of the word continue. Diane Hoffman, 58 Harrison Avenue. Uh, talk about a through street. Harrison Avenue is, um, re uh, has speed bumps and they are very entertaining because it hasn't really slowed down many drivers. It just scrapes the bottom of their car as they fly over the speed bump. Um, what I'm just interested in is the long range Vista here, because are we going to go through this again when we have to address what's going to happen to the former Hamilton School? Hamilton well, from a builder's remedy perspective, this one I think I can answer. Um, as I understand it, Ed, this is like two when you're done. Y yes, this w we we would not have to face this again. This. So there's no a after this builder's remedy lawsuit is addressed and finalized. That's it for Builder's Remedy. So that we will, we will if, if their developer comes in to, to start to do something with Hamilton School, we will have control. At yeah, the I mean, there, there's, you know, there's zoning requirements, there are planning requirements over there. You know, so yeah, that, that would be the regular quote unquote land use process. They'd have to go through whatever applications, they'd have to come before whatever land use boards, they would be completely governed by that process. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Alex Mondrieff. I live on 204 Jackson Avenue. Uh, I've been a resident of Highland Park for 10 years. My two kids are born here and go to public schools here. And certainly the future of the town is a great concern of me. And um, I understand I can't talk about uh, litigation, but regardless of what uh, uh, happens to both of these parcels, uh, we're going to have a uh, large influx of new students to our schools. And I'd like to ask what's Boros' plan to accommodate the students? Well, I don't know that we can talk a lot about that yet because we don't know the final numbers of what the second one is going to look like from that perspective. Uh, I can say that we have been meeting with the school on a regular basis. We, we meet with the Board of Education on average about once a month, right? Uh, Susie is our representative, and I think that she would tell you that uh, you know, we have had a number of these conversations with the schools about uh, the potential impact. And you know, I was on the, not this school board, I was on the board of a private school for an extended period of time. And we've had the conversations about not just the absolute number of students, but quality of education here is what it is because of small class size, uh, you know, special subjects that are offered, and so on. So we've had this conversation you know, in a, on a number of levels with the school in terms of absolute number of students, capacity of the school, um, the impact of hiring more teachers. So, you know, there are a variety of different potential effects. And we've tried to model that in a variety of ways. Um, to say nobody is concerned, I, you know, I don't think that's true. To say that the schools feel that, uh, Susie, how would we best phrase this? Uh, 
Go ahead, feel free to jump in. <laughs> um, uh, we, we have talked to the schools about this. Obviously, it's on their minds. Um, uh, right now, they're not hitting capacity, and, and they feel they can absorb this right now. But we're, we are, I, I could tell you about from council's perspective, and, and also just from the school's perspective, too. I mean, they are looking at the longer range um, impact of this. And we're stuff. trying to be creative in how we can explore that, you know, for the for the collective benefit of the community. There, you know? there's, there's not, there's not, you know, I mean, there's not much more we could do on this particular um, scenario because of how it's treated in the court. But, but uh, just one comment, which will actually, you know, one of the negotiated, excuse me, one of the points in the negotiation is the configuration of these units, meaning so how many one bedrooms, how many two bedrooms. So it was our goal to create a product, you know, in addition to, you know, lower density that uh, that also has, you know, not so many three bedrooms that wouldn't, you know, that, you know, we're look, these are all things that we're looking to do through negotiation, which we can do, you know, and that would, let's say if there's two bedrooms, there's just, there's more, you know, might have one child, maybe a few younger ones, and they're more likely to use, like say these units as, uh, not a temporary home, but a starter home, and then they move off to a larger, you know, much like I did when I was younger. So it, that is part of the negotiation, and the the beauty of it is to try to get the best product there that not only is good for the people that are there, but for the town as well. And we had, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, uh, I, it's your time, but I, I just would like to emphasize, we did have this conversation with Randy, you know, we did tell him, point blank, you know, we understand what Mount Laurel says about a community's responsibility to provide for the students versus the developer's responsibility. Nonetheless, people have this as a legitimate concern. And it is a legitimate concern of ours. And so just because we're facing off in front of the judge, you know, th this is not about being obstinate. This is about being real and being practical and the impact on the community. So, you know, that much I can tell you is that uh, we're not just trying to deal with it in terms of what the impact is vis-a-vis -vis ultimately what's the space in the school. You know, we have raised, the, I, I think I can say, well, I already did, so Ed, if you tell me I can't, I guess it's too late now, the toothpaste is out of the tube. That, that is part of the conversation. I mean, we have, I can't tell you what his reaction was or wasn't to that, but, you know, we certainly tried to cover every one of the possible issues that you've raised, that we've thought of in terms of where the impacts could be, the choke points could be, the congestion could be, the problem areas could be, and, and so on. Uh, I'm sorry, please go ahead. No, no, I just want to say that you know, I appreciate that, you know, the uh, council has been a great concern for that, and you know, apparently we didn't stand into a problem because that's one of the reasons that a lot of people, including my family, came to live in Highland Park. So likewise. Li likewise, by the way. Uh, I have two questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And the first question I'm going to ask you is that. The site, did it manufacture at one time fluorescent bulbs? I don't, don't know. know. I, I, I don't know. If they did, I, I don't know what the gluten is. Uh, the second question. That would be, that would be mercury, right? Fluorescent bulbs? Yeah, mercury. Yeah, no, I don't think they did. That wouldn't be in the water, that would be in the ground. Right, but I don't think they did. Right, I don't believe they did. My, my question really is, what is the impact of not passing this ordinance change, this amendment? land use ordinance amendment. What would really be the impact to this community if you voted it down? Well, that, I don't think that relates to this at all. Right? You're talking about number 13? Yes. That, that doesn't relate to this at all. Okay, that we don't have anything on the agenda that relates to an actual land use ordinance amendment or anything that relates to the, this proceeding. No. No, it's okay. It's a, it's a continuing concern that people have. Okay, uh, any other questions or comment? Lou? Let me so indulge. I spoke with the mayor about this, and I'd like you guys to review a, a copy of a site plan. And it, it kind of. I'm sorry, you just need to tell us who you are and where you live. I apologize. Right. Lou Pigginson, 200 Jackson Avenue. Uh, there's, I have plenty of problems. Thanks. Um, it, it, it goes to amplify um, some of the points you folks have already made. What it is is the site plan that American Properties put on the table in 2010, June 2010. And correct me if I'm wrong, guys, because I don't have this committed to memory, but it's for 138 units. 
um, for this for this exact parcel of land. It, it was mixed use. There's for sale units, as well as rental units. And uh, lo and behold, they were able to get uh, what's the number? Twenty eight. Twenty eight. Thank you. Um, uh, affordable units on on site for twenty percent. Now that that's from twenty ten. Now I'm not arguing on behalf of this site plan. I think it's atrocious in terms of the densities. But I would like to I, I present it to you, good folks. Um, so as to illustrate um, this kaleidoscopic entity that is Mr. Randy Chick in, Amer in American Properties. It's 184 now, it was 138 then. The market was much worse two and a half years ago. I'm, I'm, you know, is that a fair statement? Um, wh why, am I, why am I pointing that out? And because Mr. Chick in American Properties are one of the principals, as well as the Borough of Highland Park, and as well as uh, Judge Paley uh, supported by the, the master. I, I don't think, given um, our contact with Mr. Chick, that um, he's doing anything but negotiating all the time he's, and with smoke and mirrors. Now, what would I be doing that if I were in his position? Perhaps. Um, nonetheless, I'm trying to establish here with you good folks that, Mr., that this is, as Patrick pointed out so well, this is a negotiating process. So at the beginning of a meeting, when we're standing on the site, and Mr. Chick says that Honeywell's responsible for the cleanup, and then 45 minutes into the meeting later on, when in looking directly at the master appealing, in my opinion, for some rationale to support greater density, all of a sudden, it's Honeywell, uh, excuse me, it's American Properties, who, who, who was uh, responsible for the cleanup. So therefore, as he, quite succinctly pointed out, the density has to go up because of the dangers of that, that his small company, just his little mom and pop shop, is that a, an accurate quote? Um, which um, they have to get that extra density so as to protect them where Pulte could just go out there and throw their, you know, throw, take, take a shot. And, and tell me if I'm, I'm if I'm being too dramatic, that's what I heard. Um, at the same time, and to support what Mary um, Curran had said, Mary and I met with Mr. Chick a year and a half ago, and it was prior to the seat, uh, seating of this, of this council, and we were told at that point that the two developers were, were, were talking about a, a million dollar contribution from each developer, again, correct me if I'm wrong, to address the rehab commitment that we thought we had at the time, which we don't have. And in that meeting, when we spoke with Mr. Chick, he said, well, you know, that million dollars is going to cost us really a lot. We've got to go with greater density. Well into the meeting, uh, Ms. Kerr and I just said, well, we know the owners of the property who happen to live in Highland Park. If we got them to drop the price, what, what did we know? You know? We were blowing smoke, too. What happens if we got them to drop the price of, of a million dollars? An hour later, well, it would, only, it would only lower the density to maybe, we'd be only a million dollars, maybe that's two units out of the total. So Mr. Chick uses the numbers as he sees fit. It's, it's creative arithmetic. It was 138 in 2010 when there was no market out there, now it's 184. Why, why do I say this? Because I, I have, I understand the standing of the, of the lawsuit. I understand that. Um, it was clear that the, the front parcel um, the, was, the, was going to be developed in a plan under a different set of circumstances. However, it is clear that it's a negotiation. I, we cannot in any way, it doesn't seem any way that anyone's going to influence Mr. Chick. He's going up. Just by the way, that's what Mr. Gershberg did with his property when he went from whatever it was to 365, essentially to call the question, asking for a summary judgment. Negotiating, if you will. I see that this process is a negotiation that will ultimately rest with you folks. And we don't have the legal standing that we had on the front parcel. But nonetheless, in the November meeting in front of the judge, the judge identified this builder's remedy lawsuit as unique. No other lawsuits, no other situations exist in the state of New Jersey that are similar to our situation. Is that correct, sir? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is not that this threatening 
executioner called Builder's Remedy. The horrors of Builder's Remedy are not necessarily the threat that various folks would have us believe. If Judge Paley went so far as in, in, in an attempt to answer our questions as to what we could expect from Mount Laurel. After all, we had been worried in Highland Park that we were not in compliance with Mount Laurel II, but we found out we really are. So what to expect from Mount Laurel III? And I'm trying again to ca characterize the situation as it relates to another principle being Judge Paley. Judge Paley said, who knows? Turn to the resident expert in the room, excuse me, not the resident expert, the expert in the room, Mr. Serenian, which I almost fell down. Here's the judge from his bench re deferring to one of the counsels of one of the parties, saying what, what can we expect um, for it, when it's gonna come out of the Supreme Court, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Essentially, Judge Paley has no idea as to what a builder's remedy is to be. No one does, and it's not a criticism of the judge. What does battle builder's remedy mean? Okay, we all know that to resolve this lawsuit, we want to be in compliance with um, code or affordable housing legislation. But there's no guidelines, so it's a, again a negotiation. Excuse me for being so passionate, but you know, it, it, I'm not in any way trying to, to lecture. I'm just trying to get my point across, thank you. Um, so, in that regard, I, I don't look to, to, to Mr. Chick to be somewhat reasonable. He's, his numbers are going up, down, sideways, everywhere. No matter what <clears throat> particular question that is raised to him, he's gonna answer it in a fashion that suits him. And in my op opinion, having negotiated labor contracts, he's sticking to a high number. So, so that whatever number we come back with is gonna go, is gonna uh, be pulled up towards that number. So, I'll, I'll ask a question, please. What are the densities of the late, of the recent projects in, in Highland Park, at least recent developments? What do you, which developments? Well, let's start with Mr. Gershberg and Pulte's development. That was uh, somewhere around nine. Just, just, just below nine. Just below, just below, below nine. nine. Pulte's development at the center. Well, I'm not trying to say, yeah. They're just trying to, it's, this is a numbers game. Right. And that was 5.8. What about the Y? That hasn't gone forward yet. But, but there's a, a proposal for it. Yeah, it's like 21, 21 units or something. So it's, it's about, about five or acres. six. Yeah, five, right. five roughly an acre. And the reason I'm pointing this out, and L'Ambiance is around five. Um, I don't know of any, that's correct. L'Ambiance, and then that's a little older, but why, why is it relevant? Well, it's just on the other side of the, railroad tracks from, from this parcel. What I'm trying to say here is, are there any other developments that we have on, on paper? The, the, the castle development, That's is there anything on paper with that? It's going before the planning board at the next meeting. Do we know what the density is? Um, not not yet. We, we it, it's, it's a little higher than what we're used to seeing, but they haven't finalized it. Five, nine, 184 divided by seven and a half is 25, I think. Well, j just to cut to the chase, we're gonna do better than this, I can guarantee you. So, you can forget the 180, it's it's not even in the realm of possibility. That's 130. That's right, right, we're gonna do better than this. We're gonna do better than this. And that's 18. We're gonna Which do better than twice, that. twice is what we did first. And I'm not trying to be contentious with you, Pat. Well, I'm just telling you we're gonna do better than that. Okay. Um, That's all I can say. I'm glad you said that. You said too much, but okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right it's fine. And, um, I'm not, what, it's not a done deal, but I'm not, this is unacceptable. What I have tried to, to highlight is where we, we stand in the situation. I spoke with Honeywell yesterday. They say that the property is pretty well remediated. And some of the questions that were raised on site, whether they would be responsible, whether they go to residential, or industrial, they, they, it's, according to them, they're gonna to go to residential, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. So where was Mr. Chick's point that it was gonna cost him money to, 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 um, to remediate? Why, is it, why does the density ha have to alleviate his expenses? Not only based on principle, but also based on, on fact. Further, he also made this 
the statement on site, and this is a question that some of us in the neighborhood debate all the time, is he, he felt that he would have a better guarantee with for, uh, for, excuse me, for rental units. And I'm not, I'm not trying to step into that bail of it. But what I would like to point out is Pulte is just involved in two projects in the neighborhood that are way less density than what he's talking about. And, and they were for sale. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's what we want, but what I'm saying is his market research has just been done by Pulte, next below him and across the, and, and across the railroad tracks. I mean, if, if he doesn't trust Pulte's organization, then I guess he is a really, really a mom and pop shop. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to beat him up anymore. I just don't, I just don't trust him. Um, and, and, I, and I, I'm suggesting to you that you folks have a great deal more standing in this negotiation than I think you really understand. And, I, and I'm not trying to, again to be, to be pompous. What I am saying is, is stay in the line, stay in the line for the strength of our community. If indeed our neighborhood, which is eight units for, per acre, eight residential aid units per acre, and we've just seen nine units go through, and it's gonna be a viable profit-making enterprise, and Builders Remedy says nothing precedential about this. Is that correct? Is there a, and so then negotiate, and keep negotiating until the, the gentleman comes in to what is quoted in their lawsuit, in Shimanowitz's lawsuit, is that what they are bound to is what sound land use practice and environmental, environment, environmentally sound. And what, what sound land use practice is something consistent with the neighborhood. Let's correct the mistakes that were made 100 years ago on uh, Cleveland Avenue, made that a, uh, a, a less, a, it made that island, that property that existed now, an island within a residential community bounded by the railroad tracks. I don't know if that, certainly a less dense residential community than what's on, on the table, okay? Um, what, what sort of, where do we go from here? And, and I'm sorry to keep you folks for so long, but given that there's no, no further meeting this month, and we had a lot of folks that wanted to speak, I appreciate your time. Yeah, that's fine, but we also have somebody that's waiting for us inside, and I certainly, as you know, I don't like to stifle public discussion, but I do okay. want to make sure that we. I, I, I wanted to uh, speak, but thank you. What's, what, what can we expect? What, what timetable is on the table? What, what are you guys bringing to bear? What, is Serenian and Bill Caton, are they back to work on this? Yeah. They've never left. They, they've been at it for whatever period of time that we've been engaged with the developer. And we're still engaged with the developer. I assume we're going to have one, if not more, additional meetings with them. Uh, you know, whatever it takes to figure out whether or not we can reach a settlement or we're not going to reach a settlement, you know. And um, so we don't have something that's imminent. I mean, you know, the judge has a calendar that puts us somewhere during the summer, you know. But by the same token, if we believe, you know, if the parties believe that we should continue to talk, I don't think the judge is going to say, well, fine, then let's call the question. Why don't you guys see if you can work it out? I, you know, the judge would... It, my understanding is the courts prefer to see negotiated settlements if they can. That doesn't mean that the judge is going to force us to settle just for the sake of settling. But at some point, the judge will say, if you guys can't work it out through settlement, then you're going to have to come before me and we're going to have to resolve this. Now, the judge, as far as I know, has not said that to us. I think we can say that. So that means for the time being, at least, we can continue to talk. That could take us through the summer. You know, may not take us through the summer. If we come to something that we think we like sooner, if we don't like it, then, you know, we'll see where we are at that point in time. Well, it seems to be. Well, again, I can't, you, Mary, I, I heard you, it's okay. No, you can't say it's but here, so let, me, let, let me say this, okay, for, for whatever it's worth. You mentioned Serenian and Caton. We have, by er, I think everybody in this room who's familiar with their track record, you know, you, you know this as well as we do, we think we've got experts that are assisting us who are the experts' experts. And so, you know, we continue to consult with them they respond to us as they see that there are circumstances that require, whether it's you know redirection, rethinking, reevaluation, recreation, reinvention, whatever it might be. Um, we've put a lot of things on the table. Things have come back at us. I mean, there's there's active discussion, uh, and and I think that's a healthy thing. 
Um, you know, where that's going to lead, I don't really know. In terms of... I wish they would have heard this tonight. I'm sorry? I wish they would have heard this tonight. Let's just... I, I, I guess I can't emphasize this strongly enough, okay? Um, Randy and I have had some pretty heated conversations, okay? We've had some pretty intense discussions. We've had some very candid discussions. We've had some good discussions that have been, you know, to use the term constructive, no pun intended. And, you know, we've had other discussions, too. Um, so while they may not have heard this, you know, I've said it before, and, you know, I'll say it for as long as I'm sitting in this chair and maybe longer. We hear you. We really do. And I am doing everything I possibly can, at his, as is Patrick, as is Ed, as is Phil, as is Jeffrey, to make sure that American Properties and the Master are hearing you, too. Now, where that's going to go, in the end, I don't know. But there is nothing that I've heard tonight to you that has not been said to the master or to any of the other parties that are involved in this lawsuit. I mean, we are absolutely emphasizing each and every one of these points. We live in this town, too. You know, I don't necessarily think that it's such a great idea to be able to say that, you know, a renter is less of a person. You know, so therefore, there's, there should be less of a, you know, a consideration there. You know, and I'm not going to get into, you know, what Randy's rationale is or isn't for whatever he may or may not be thinking on that point. You know, we get that. We, we get that. You know, we live here. We understand the concerns related to traffic. We understand the concerns related to density. We understand the economic issues, drawbacks, the school issues, et cetera, as they relate to higher density, lower density, for sale, and so on. You know, we understand what, what the market trends have been or have not been. Um, so, you know, you may get this impression that, like, you know, we sit here, we're yesing you to death. I, I got to tell you something. You know, in, in the last couple of discussions we had, we've had some very cordial discussions. There were times where I thought we were ready to, like, come to blows. I mean, you know, but the goal is not to be aggressive with the guy just to prove who can shout the loudest. The goal is to come up with something that works for the community, and that's what we're trying to do. I can't say any more than that, but I can't be more candid than that. The rest is up to you guys. You know, in the end, you'll believe that. You won't believe that. That's your call. I'm not saying that to be dismissive. I'm not saying it to be obnoxious. We hear what you're saying. We really do. You know, I want you to keep talking to us about what your concerns are. I like to think that this governing body has done nothing but try to encourage the dialogue to the extent that we could. You know, certainly, I think that if there's anything that I've spent the bulk of my time on, it's these two Mount Laurel lawsuits. I signed up for this. I'm okay with that. But we absolutely believe in the rightness of what it is that we're trying to accomplish as a community. We don't know where it's going to go. But just because we're not telling you everything doesn't mean that what's being said here, granted, maybe if 20 people say it, maybe it has more impact. But I wouldn't want you to think that, you know, it goes in one ear, yeah, that's great, then, you know, Randy and I are, you know, laughing about this behind the scenes. Quite the opposite is the case. And I'm not saying you would even suggest that. Quite the opposite is the case. All the concerns that you've expressed, additional concerns that you may express, we continue to share those concerns. We continue to advocate for what we think are the appropriate points of view for Highland Park. I would um, like to just reiterate a point that you made before, and that is that indeed we are uh, subject to, you know, we're not only on the outside, we're not even looking in. So um, it's, it's on the one hand, uh, we're so grateful for what happened in the front parcel. I think it's great for Highland Park. Um, what I I tried to talk about numbers, and, and my wife just gave me the, the cut sign. I'm too, I'm Thank you, Eileen. <laughs> I see you listen to her as well as I listen to my wife at times. <laughs> but when we we come to you, and I don't want to be you when you get home. By the way, I I don't want to be you when you get home. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I do. I do. I didn't mean to make you blush. What I, I want to say is please understand that when you're talking about 28 units per acre, it's different than hearing about four and a half. And it is threatening as hell. Okay? It is threatening as hell. So until, and, and some of us conceive of the front the, the developer as almost a miracle, you know, the density in the front. So what I'm saying to you is, is, is we, he, we know that you're listening, but... We're going to keep talking to you. We have to. That's Highland Park. Threatening. That's it is absolutely threatening. That, I, I, that's Highland Park. I don't think it should be or would be any other way. Let me way. close on a good note. 
Actually, Bergman was a very special friend of mine, a really, real pow powerful influence in my life. Um, and I'm not going to be upset enough about it. But thank you so much for honoring that man. I too had a special affection for him, and he was a real mensch. Any other public discussion? Thank you, Lou. Any other public discussion? Okay, seeing that there's none, thank you all for your heartfelt expression of concern and your passionate and articulate advocacy for your concerns. And um, we've got some other business we're going to do. So, uh, Clerk, can you report on advertising land use ordinance amendment for consideration of passage on final reading by title? An ordinance amending the Code of the Borough of Highland Park 2010, Chapter 230, Land Development, was duly advertised for consideration and passage on final reading by title and affidavits of publication are on file. The ordinance was posted and made available for public inspection as required by law. Okay, can I have a motion to take up the ordinance on final reading? Motion to can adopt. I, can I have a second? No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, motion to take up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Motion to take up. Can I have a second? Second. Second. Okay. Uh, public hearing? Seeing that there's none, can I have a motion to adopt the ordinance and advertise? Motion to adopt. I'm sorry. Well, <coughs> we, we need to clarify with the clerk. I don't think we've gotten the report back. Is this the one, John? Aren't we going to table this one? Just the land use ordinance yes. at the... Uh, I'm we had, asleep right now. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we conducted the public hearing. We have to wait for the planning board to Most come back to us. They're going to okay. comment on June the 20th. Okay. So I respectfully request that you table voting on this okay. until the meeting on July 2nd. Can I have a motion to table? Motion to table. Second. Second. Okay. So that's removed. Okay. Can we go on with the next one? Can you report on advertising naming Middlesex County Enforcing AG for, Agency for Fire Prevention for consideration of passage on final reading by title? An ordinance amending the Code of the Borough of Highland Park 2010, Chapter 39, concerning the Fire Prevention Enforcement Agency was duly advertised for consideration of passage on final reading by title and affidavits of publication are on file. The ordinance was posted and made available for public inspection as required by law. Okay, motion to take up the ordinance. Motion to take up. Second. Okay, public hearing. Seeing that there's none, uh, motion to adopt. Motion to adopt. Second. Okay. Roll call. <coughs> Councilwoman Burl Mittler? Yes. Councilman Erickson? Yes. Councilman Malay? Yes. Councilman Potts? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're up to the consent agenda. So this is items 15 through 27, resolution 613-189 through 613-201 inclusive, uh, all uh, resolutions. Uh, to approve change orders for the public safety building, to amend the annual salary resolution, to approve the bills list, to approve payment to public safety building architect, to approve taxi operators, to refund duplicate tax payment, to appoint a housing authority member, to amend the free resolution 113-119, to approve pay estimate number 9 to H&S construction for the public safety building, to approve the waiver of fees for the townwide garage sale, to approve the 2013 and 14 ABC licenses, plenary retail distribution and consumption, to appoint a redevelopment agency member and a resolution concerning designation of certain lands in the borough as an area in need of redevelopment. So can I have a motion? Motion to adopt. Second. Roll call. Councilwoman Bro mittler Yes. Councilman Erickson? Yes. Councilman Malay? Yes. Councilman Potts? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Okay, can you report on the election clerk of a volunteer firefighter? Received notification from the Highland Park Volunteer Firefighter of the election of Michael Gershon as a volunteer firefighter. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion to confirm? So moved. Roll call. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I second. Have a second. Thank you. Can I have a roll call now? Councilwoman Brill Mittler? Yes. Councilman Erickson? Yes. Councilman Millay? Yes. Councilman Potts? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Okay, uh, the mayor appoints the following. So I will report, appoint Stephen Mittler to the Rec Advisory Committee, Anne Glatt and John Boucher to the Council on Aging, and Tara Canavera to the Human Relations Commission. Uh, I need a motion to confirm. Motion. Second. I need a second, please. Second. second. Okay, can I have a roll call vote? Councilwoman Brill Mittler? Abstain. 
Councilman Erickson? Yes. Councilman Malay? Yes. Councilman Potts? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovich? Yes. Okay, I don't see any other public here. Chief, do you have anything? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> All right, so can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, please. Okay. Second. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. The conference, right? The conference. Yes.